I woke up, looked around, and then realized something. All the guns were missing. They're gone. Screw me. They're gone, I exclaimed. Marlo stumbled awake, definitely shaking off a hangover that he somehow had. What's gone, son? The guns. Somebody stole them. Even the 50 cal. Yeah, I answered. Marlo kicked the wall in frustration. That is it. Everybody get up now. At one, all 30-something kids jumped out of their sleep, obviously wondering as to why their 50-something principal was screaming his lungs out at 6 in the morning. What's going on? Armin asked, groggily. The heck do you think is going on? Somebody stole my guns. Who took all my kids? You don't have kids. Yeah, I have two, but I don't know them. No, I'm talking about the guns. The only thing that's keeping our butts alive. Nobody in the class stole your guns, Marlo, I said. Somebody else, probably. And that's when it hit me. That piece of crap. Ryan, I yelled. It was him. He did it. Who's Ryan and how many testicles does he have? Because he ain't going to have any when I find him, Marlo said. I answered. The jock in the football team this year. The one who got suspended for sneaking cheap whiskey into the fruit punch in the staff lounge. Why isn't he here with us then? I never saw him at any time, he spat. Remember that trouble that Blame Armin and I got into the hallway during the night watch? Yeah, I continued. Well, when the lockdown had first started, he wanted to get out of the classroom to save some kid who was already dead, and he ended up getting himself taken. But I guess that he somehow escaped, and he's pissed off because we didn't save him, and he held Armin at knife point in the classroom. He tried to stab me, but Blame shot him, and we just got out of dodge, but I guess he survived, found us, and took our guns. Armin interrupted. Well, if that idiot is still alive and he stole our guns while everybody was asleep, why didn't he just kill us when we were sleeping? Because he's a psychopath. I suggested. I guess he thought that way of death was way too fast and he wanted to leave that to the drones. I checked the office doors. I just locked the doors anyway. No way the drones are going to get in this four knocks. I watched across the office full of teenagers and grabbed the old sphere that I had first carved out of a broomstick when the lockdown had began. Guess we'll have to go back to being old school. Why didn't the drones kill Ryan? He was out there for the whole night, and we didn't hear any screams except when Edmund was being a baby. I have a theory, Charlie said. I got ready for a very long scientific rant and sat down in one of the folding chairs beside Blame. He continued. So, we're prey to the drones and they're the predators. We have or used to have guns which block the predators the drones, from killing and eating us. But I guess they have some level of intelligence because I bet they observed Ryan stealing our weapons and watched what he would do next. Ryan is removing our defenses as prey to defend ourselves, which the drones now know. I don't know how or why, but I think the drones don't or won't kill Ryan because he's doing acts that help them kill and hunt us. So, essentially, Ryan and the drone colony in our school have some kind of symbiotic relationship. As long as Ryan jeopardizes us and our defenses, the drones won't kill him and they'll keep him alive. So basically, the drones won't kill Ryan because he's helping them. Got it, you numbskulls. Yeah, I said. But how do you know all this stuff? Because I try to avoid ending up working at McDonald's. Oh, Marlo declared. Okay, okay, enough chit-chat. If we don't have guns, how are we going to kill these monsters? I still got mine, Blame said, pulling his shirt up to reveal his old pistol with the crap dipped bullets. Marlo walked her over to Blame. Brian, give me the gun. No way, dog, this is mine. I paid for it. Just give me the gun. I've been in the army for more than 15 years. You're a cheap dollar store shot off the streets. Fine, fine, dang. Blame handed the pistol to Marlo. I started looking around the office for broomsticks and wooden chair legs or anything that we could weaponize, just like we had done when the lockout had first started. 
I ended up with 15 makeshift and real weapons, 10 we originally had from our class and 5 new ones that I had managed to MacGyver. Here, I tossed a spear to blame. Ah, oh, we have to use these sticks. We had another problem. We had completely run out of food. We had two options, either look for dead bodies to cook and eat like we're cannibals or we could raid the cafeteria and try to find lunches. How? I asked Marlow once he had addressed the food problem. We only have 15 spears and one gun with one and a half magazines left. We'll have to improvise. I mean, heck, your class survived for more than four hours with just a bunch of spears and one gun. You can do it again. All you need to do is watch out for Ryan or he'll blow your brains out. A few minutes later and with Blame's gun back, we were barging into classrooms looking for lunches and stuffing them into backpacks that we had. Where do you think Ryan is? I asked, emptying out a backpack on the floor. Eh, probably with the drones, Armin laughed. Yeah, screw him. We finished up looting the classroom and moved on to the next. After the fifth empty classroom, our backpacks were so heavy with food that we couldn't move and decided that we would only go and loot once more. I reached for the doorknob, turned it, and I pushed the door open, and I felt the cold barrel of a shotgun, my old shotgun pressed against my forehead. Gotcha. And then he pulled the trigger. A loud bang erupted through the room, making my ears ring, but I didn't get it. Why wasn't I dead? Ryan had shot me at point-blank range and somehow... I wasn't dead on the ground. Ryan had a makeshift bandage wrapped around his forearm and had a nasty grin on his face, but this time he wasn't alone. He had five other people with him, probably survivors who were once his friends wearing identical hooded cloaks fashioned out of multiple jackets and shirts, except one of them was a tallish man in his 50s or 60s with neatly combed hair and a three-piece business suit. Ryan said the next part slowly but very clearly. That shot was a blank and it didn't have any ammo in it. He quickly pulled the pump and the shotgun back and forth. But this one is real. Step in the room, all of you. He looked at the rest of the Algoma extermination team. We gave into his threat and we stepped into the room. What do you want, Ryan? I asked. He didn't answer. Instead, the middle-aged man in the suit stepped forward and grinned like a total psychopath. Allow me to introduce myself. My name is Lawrence, CEO and operator of CORE, and the assistant leader of the Order of Kala Tagathlaku. That's nonsense, dog, Blame said. Lawrence ignored the comment. It has come to my attention that you little craps have killed a number of the servants, and that is absolutely unacceptable. What the heck is Kala Tagothlik, you gramps? I screamed as Ryan stepped back with his shotgun at my sudden outburst. I slightly chuckled. Lawrence looked offended, but he didn't lose his confidence. Kala Tagothlik, you, was there when the oceans were first created, and he will be here long after. He is the ruler of the ocean, the king of madness, overlord of the anglers and the drones. Overseer of monsters and the all-powerful. Yeah, this guy is insane. Armin spoke up. So, Mr. Lawrence, what would you like us to do? Screw the air and make your little pets come back to life. Lawrence chuckled. It'll be much worse than that. Members of the Order seize the sacrifices. Sacrifices? What the? Ryan and the other cult members grabbed us by the arms and pulled us out of the classroom dragging us down the hallway and further away from the office. I considered screaming, but that's a hard thing to do when a 12-gauge is pressed against your back. The order dragged us to the gym. My heart dropped as soon as I saw several drones open the gym doors from the inside. We entered the dark and damp gym. There were a dozen drones on either side of us that silently parted so that Lawrence and his cult members could drag us down. We were at the heart of the gym which was now turned into a drone feeding area, and in the middle was an enormous monster, a 15 foot tall warrior drone, that growled and looked down at us. Oh crap, I whispered. 
Lawrence and the warrior drone seemed to talk in some throaty ancient language which sounded like a mix of Latin and gibberish. After this short exchange, Lawrence walked past us grinning and said to the cult members, Tie them up. I thrashed, but again, most things are hard to do when a shotgun is pointed at your head. Ryan and his goons tied the three of us to one of the organic black stalagmites with yellow ropes, as the monsters nearby growled and squirmed in anticipation. Hey, I yelled back at Ryan as he walked out of the gym exit. What? Screw you. Ryan silently grinned and shut the door and cut off all the lights coming in. In the darkness, my heartbeat went faster as the monsters growled and slowly painfully inched closer. I felt one of the tendrils brush up against my leg as the monsters circled us. I tried to squeeze into the stalagmite that we were tied to, as I only had one question. Was this the end? Would we get ripped apart piece by piece until the military busted in and found the skeletons of three teenagers? Would Ryan win? Would everybody die? Of course not. Or at least, that was my hope.